Hi there. I'm Paula Orrance, a product marketing manager at Waters Corporation, focusing on all things peptide for sample preparation and separation. Thank you for joining me for another edition of Science Spotlight, today discussing product selection for peptide characterization or peptide mapping and multi-attribute monitoring. I'm going to provide a brief overview of the characterization process so it will be easy to determine what products will be useful and where. Then we'll position a few products throughout the process, like sample containers, denaturation products, different mobile phases, and of course we'll talk about column chemistries. Then finally, some standards and reagents that can be useful to qualify or monitor your processes. Preparing a protein sample for analysis of peptides is probably one of the more grueling sample preparation processes out there. There are many steps, each of which takes a decent amount of time to perform, but it all boils down to this, truly understanding the composition of your sample. I always describe the protein digestion as cr uncrumbling a ball of paper. If someone hands you a ball of paper and asks you to cut it into smaller pieces with a pair of scissors, would you take them directly to the crumpled ball or would you flatten it out before trying to cut it into smaller pieces? Well, if you think about the native protein structure as a ball of paper, then the process of unfolding and cutting is depicted here. Unfolding is completed by denaturing and sometimes reducing and alkylating the protein. Depending on the denaturation product that's used, sometimes guanidine hydrochloride is necessary, then a desalting step is required in order to remove the salts for a successful enzymatic digestion. And then the optional cleanup step is followed by an enzymatic digestion and analytical separation. Again, I'm going to focus on a few products throughout the workflow that will either aid in data quality, in improved data quality, or sample processing. The first of which is sample containers. For instance, the collection plates that live in the LC for injecting your samples. The plastics that the sample interact with are often an afterthought. However, because these samples are indeed interacting with the surface of the plastic, it's important to consider it in an effort to protect the samples that we just worked so dil diligently to prepare. Here, the impact of nonspecific binding is depicted by therapeutic peptide luprolide. There are two different sets of peaks here, one large, one small, but the only difference is the care taken to mitigate the nonspecific binding, in which case we see far more sensitive and reproducible chromatography. Without that care, the percent CV increases to just about 42% and the peak is 50 times smaller. So how do we take proper care of our samples to mitigate nonspecific binding when they could perhaps be living in the LC for long injection cycle times for overnight or even over a weekend? Quan Recovery with Max Peak High Performance Surfaces, otherwise HPS, is a new brand of plates and vials designed to protect your samples from nonspecific binding. With a 700 microliter 96 well plate and a 300 microliter low residual volume vial, your samples are protected regardless of your sample volume or even your sample size. Perhaps you've prepared 12 samples, but each has that long cycle time, maybe 120 minutes. It's going to be at least 24 hours before your last sample is injected. Don't you want to ensure that it's in the same state as the initially injected sample? Quan Recovery will help to protect those samples. Nonspecific binding is a complex phenomenon. Let's take a look at four therapeutic peptides placed into a variety of different sample containers. The peptides are glucagon, insulin, melatonin, and desmopressin. Now, glucagon and melatonin are both very hydrophobic. Insulin is on the larger side, and desmopressin is fairly easy to separate and quantify. Now, we've placed them into the Quan Recovery plates and vials, various glass vials, and then various polypropylene plates and vials. We can see that every peptide will suffer from nonspecific binding loss at some point. Desmopressin is behaving very well, as shown in a variety of the containers, no matter the container type, and it's got great recovery across all of them. We can see that that's not necessarily true for the other three peptides. We've got great recovery in the Quan Recovery containers, but we lose nearly all of the glucagon in the other containers and absolutely all of the insulin and the melatonin. 
The sample container can play a fairly large role in nonspecific binding and the ability to detect your analytes. So we want to use Quan Recovery to help stabilize the samples over those long injection cycles. Like I mentioned, Quan Recovery can aid in protecting samples from nonspecific binding during sample preparation as well as the injection cycle. Next up is the unfolding process, specifically denaturation. Before digesting your protein sample, some proteins require pretreatment known as denaturation to facilitate the unfolding of the protein, making those cleavage sites available for enzymatic activity or even chemical activity and will help yield a higher quality digest. Chiotriptic agents, um, very high concentrations of salt are often required to facilitate denaturation. However, those same agents can destroy the enzymatic activity. So they must be removed prior to digestion. Unfortunately, this step is laborious and fairly slow, but we do have other options available that will remove those fairly slow and laborious steps. A variety of detergents, also sometimes referred to as surfactants, can be used to prepare a protein for digestion. Why uh, sodium dodecyl sulfate or SDS is commonly used, it is certainly not LC or LCMS compatible, so alternatives are far, far more desired. Rapigest is one of those alternatives that will not interfere with the enzymatic efficiency or activity. Note that the enzyme digestion of the protein is frequently halted by lowering the pH of the sample. Um, so perfectly so, Rapigest also decomposes at lower pH levels because it's acid labile. Additionally, its breakdown byproducts will not affect the subsequent reverse phase separation of mass analysis detection. So it really does work as an excellent alternative. Here we can see how denaturing with Rapigest prior to digestion can aid in process efficiency. Myoglobin required an overnight digestion without Rapigest, but with Rapigest only required a five minute digestion. You can also see the improvement in peak height after the Rapigest aided digestion and separation. Using Rapigest prior to digestion removes the need for desalting and it can improve digestion efficiency, improving your process efficiency. So if we skip ahead a little bit and go to separation section, um, mobile phases used in separation are extremely important, especially when the options are, are really can be fairly overwhelming. Eye enhanced difluoroacetic acid is the perfect middle ground between formic acid and trifluoroacetic acid. Now, TFA is famous for ion suppression on MS applications, and formic acid just doesn't retain some of the peptides as well. But DFA offers improvements over signal and, retex and retention for both of those options. For optical detection, formic acid isn't usually the desired mobile phase, but in the instance of dual detection, for example, using UV and MS, the broader peak shapes and higher baselines of formic acid is really the lesser evil of the ion suppression that comes from TFA. But for optics, DFA, difluoroacetic acid, has a much better peak shape and baseline than the formic acid. Finally, the high purity of eye enhanced DFA removes impurities and extraneous peaks from your chromatography. In this example of high resolution MS, the improvements of retention over formic acid and improvement increased peak area over trifluoroacetic acid are clear simply by switching to difluoroacetic acid. It may not offer the same level of intensity as formic acid does for MS applications, but the change in selectivity can be key for troublesome separations. One of the biggest questions I get asked is, but what does DFA do if I'm already using a charged particle like CSH? Well, great news, whether using the BEH particle or the CSH particle, the benefits of DFA are really the same. It always amazes me to see what small changes like changing the mobile phase or even the particle chemistry can do for your chromatography. Here we have many different selectivity options, 
because we're combining those three mobile phases with two of the column chemistries. And even across the board or between just the two columns, you can see how minor changes can really affect either positively or to perhaps a detriment uh, your chromatography. I mentioned earlier the importance of the DFA purity, and that should be really driven home here. By highlighting the T37 peptide on the light chain, we can easily observe the difference between the raw DFA and the eye enhanced DFA. Here, even the highest purity of formic acids introduces some impurities that you can see next to our highest peaks here. But the eye enhanced DFA, because we take the time to properly purify it and monitor those impurities in manufacturing, manufacturing, we've limited the impurity introduction into the sample here. Eye enhanced DFA is a great mobile phase additive to add to your repertoire, regardless of your detection modes. And even if you're only using it for the varied selectivity over the standard formic acid and trifluoroacetic acid, we are taking the time to purify the standard or additive properly. So it's not going to introduce any of those extraneous peaks into your chromatography. So moving on to column chemistries, I mentioned a few slides ago how important they are and the column chemistries are either your most comfortable playground or a completely foreign language but i promise they are excellent tools to keep in your toolbox waters offers a very wide selection of unique particle offerings with both hybrid and silica based particles both fully porous and solid core particles all with various bonded and unbonded options I often refer to BEH and HSS technologies as the grandfather and grandmother of chromatography as we know it today. BEH is the original hybrid particle, HSS is a more traditional silica particle, and then CSH and Cortex are really the new kids on the block. CSH stands for charged surface hybrid. Think of the BEH particle with that charged surface. And Cortex is that silica particle, however, with a solid core providing really, really excellent efficiency. Now, the first three of the four particles here, excluding cortex, are available as peptide columns, which means that the particles are QC'd with digested protein samples instead of a mixture of small molecules. So before you even get these columns, before you take it out of the box, they have already been introduced to a similar mixture of digested peptides that you would be injecting on it for your peptide map or your MAM. Here's a closer look at what exactly BEH technology means for particle chemistries. This hybrid particle allows for reduced peak tailing, increased chemical stability, and the much wider pH range that allows for longer column lifetimes, longer column reproducibility, longer column stability. Now for peptides, the BEH particle is available in the 130 angstrom pore and a 300 angstrom pore for your larger peptides or even smaller proteins. The larger pore allows for some more time for those larger molecules to run in and out of the pores. Our peptide CSH column, which is 130 angstrom, um, came out after the launch of BEH, and we found that the presence of a positive surface charge offers some fairly significant advantages over the BEH and HSS particles. In this approach, the BEH particles were surface modified with a low concentration of a basic ionizable silane, followed by the bonding of the C18 phase and end capping. The optimal surface concentration of the silane groups is more than an order of magnitude lower than the primary bonded phase. Then weekly, the weekly basic silane group is protonated at a low pH and is neutral above, neutral above seven. And that's why the CSH particle is great for uses with formic acid and DFA instead of what was often required trifluoroacetic acid. Depicted here are the varying selectivities of each of the peptide particle chemistries. Peptide particle chemistries meaning that they're QC'd with the triptically digested sample. And some highlights include the increased retentivity by switching to the peptide HSST3, which is a 100 angstrom pore size. Um, and in this case, the lowest retentivity is the peptide CSH, which is that 130 angstrom. 
There are numerous selectivity differ differences between all three phases or all four particles. Um, the highest peak capacity for some peptides is provided by the peptide CSH column. However, comparable average peak shape, or excuse me, peak capacities for the HSST3 and the BEH, both pore sizes are, are comparable. And then finally, it is worth mentioning that the peptide HSST3 is the best choice for small polar peptides because of that great retentivity that the HSST3 has to offer. If we zoom in to take a closer look at the separation, it's clear that the HSST3 has the greatest retention over the other four part or other three chemistries. But each chemistry offers different profiles of the same peptides, which is why we've highlighted them in yellow. And also why particle selection is so importantly to properly develop every assay effectively, because depending on the overall goals of the method, each of these columns can offer different benefits in itself. So we've zoomed in on the 26 to 55 minute of the MAB triptych digest separation and we've taken the extracted ion chromatogram, otherwise known as the XIC, for that separation. And the XIC means that we select the known mass for each of the separated peaks. For example, H14 has the mass of 1321, while H15 has a mass of 6713. And then we calculated their peak width. So we use this procedure because it eliminates the chance of calculating an incorrect peak width that would occur if more than one peptide eluded at the same time, if we had co-eluding peaks. And by measuring the peak width at only the extracted ion level, the XIC, we can obtain a more selective calculation. Now, it's worth noting that the largest peptide here in the NIST MAB or the MAB triptych digest is about 6,000 or 6.7 kilodaltons, and that both the BEH-130 and the BEH-300, 130 on top, 300 on the bottom, deliver the same average peak capacity. So the pore size does not have an effect on the peak capacity for each of these peaks or peptides. Column chemistry is another topic that is often overlooked. Many scientists are comfortable with a single column chemistry across really any modality, but we've seen that changes in selectivity of the separation can have major time-saving benefits. And of course, that, that is massively beneficial if you do have co-eluting peaks and you can remove the time required to separate those with data analysis if you can truly separate them with the chromatography. But alas, we continue to power through and we're almost there reaching our final product um, in the separation phase. And this time we're talking about standards and reagents. Last year, we added a few variations of the NIST MAB to our standards and reagents. I mentioned a couple of minutes ago the MAB triptych digest, which we are taking the time and effort to properly digest the sample and then lyophilize it so that all you need to do for the sample to be ready is a simple reconstitution prior to injection, and then you're off and ready to go. So the intact standard is another great one for qualifying your digestion protocol. You can use that as a sample in your digestion to track and make sure that the digestion is being performed properly. You can use it as a test sample even if you have some new scientists in the lab. And like I mentioned, the MAB triptych digest is great for system quality checks or even for system suitability for injection prior to, between, or at the end of any of your runs. What's great about the NIST map is that it has been characterized in such depth that we know exactly what we're looking for. And we were even able to use that information and monitor certain critical quality attributes or CQAs in our own manufacturing and quality processes to make sure that we're delivering a quality product. And that can be seen here with the BioAccord system with the separation of just the reconstituted sample of the MAP triptych digest, again, which we have properly digested, digested using methods very similar to what you're doing today, um, but eliminating the time required for you to have to digest the sample to do your quality checks. 
we have a whole repertoire of useful standards and reagents that only require simple reconstitution before it's ready for injection. And the whole family of, MAP, of NIST MAB standards, including the MAB Triptych Digest, is one of those standards that just requires simple reconstitution. So we've explored sample containers with quant recovery that will mitigate or eliminate nonspecific binding or the interaction between your protein or peptide samples with the plastic. Also acid labile denaturants with rapigest that can denature your proteins prior to digestion to increase digestion efficiency, opening up the protein to allow the enzyme into those active sites or cleavage sites. Also high purity acids for mobile phase with I enhanced DFA we've compared to the traditional formic acid and trifluoroacetic acid where the high purity of I enhanced DFA and the alternative acid lower ion pairing agents than D TFA has some, some great benefits over the traditionals. Also column chemistries with BEH, HSS, CH, CSH, and Cortex. That's always a kind of a, a, a gumball full of, <laughs> of words to try to get out at the same time, but changing minor things like the column selectivity or even the mobile phase can have huge positive impacts on your separation. And then finally, standards and reagents with the new family of the NIST MAB standards. Now the options in some of these cases can be overwhelming, uh, but we do have tons of collateral, tons of material, and truthfully, tons of scientists who are at the ready and eager to help in, in any instance that you might need assistance. So thank you for hanging out with me for the last 20 or so minutes. I, of course, have enjoyed our time together and look forward to seeing you at the next Science Spotlight.